four men are in a hospital waiting room because their wives are all having babies. Nurse comes up to the first guy and says, congratulations, you're the father of twins. He says, that's odd, I work for the Minnesota Twins. She comes up to the next guy, congratulations, you're the father of triplets. He says, that's weird, I work for the 3M company. She comes up to the fourth man, congratulations, you're the father of quadruplets. That's strange, I work for the Four Seasons Hotel. The last man is groaning and banging his head against the wall. What's wrong? I work for 7-Up. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you only had one, who knows? <laughs> they don't tell you the rest of it. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 8 says this, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Would you bow your heads with me? Dear Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to bring these morsels from your word to the believers in the house today. I pray that, I pray that you will guide this word right to where you want it to go in each heart and that will have the effect on us that you want it to have. In Jesus' name, amen. So this is really all about this one verse in Colossians 2, this verse number 8 that I just read. Paul wrote this letter when he was in Rome under house arrest waiting his trial. The trial never came because Nero took over as a dictator and he decided to persecute the Christians and Paul was executed. Paul was no likely, this is the book of, to, a letter to the Colossians, but he was no, most likely never in Colossae, where this church was that he's writing to. The church was founded by Epaphras, 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 who was a convert of Paul's, and he went around and he, and he started the church. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 7 and 8, it says, You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. So Epaphras carried the gospel to Colossae, to the Colossians, and he has traveled to Rome to report to Paul. The verse starts with, see to it, see to it. That carries a sense of a command. That is, make sure. When you say see to it, that's make sure. That's, uh, or be diligent in order to see to it. We must make a purposeful effort. We have to have a purposeful heart. Uh, we can't have a lackadaisical effort or attitude toward our faith. If you don't purposely practice the faith, you could become weak enough that the enemy will pick you off. It happened to me. It happened to me. We have to stay in the word. That's what I was, I wasn't doing that. We have to stay in prayer. I wasn't doing that. We have to stay in communication with God. I wasn't doing that. So this happened to me. I became captive, not by hollow and deceptive philosophy, but my own lackadaisical attitude about things. And I was a backslider for three years. But it helps to stay in fellowship with other believers. We need to be in fellowship. So I once referred to myself, these were years ago before I first got saved, as an independent Christian. I didn't know what I was talking about. <laughs> I didn't know what, be Christ, what being a Christian really was. You know, I, 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 I had a New Testament in my pocket, and sometimes I quoted it. But you can't just declare you're a Christian and go around being nice and think that God is pleased with you. All of our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. That means you can't be nice enough, sweet enough, generous enough, gentle enough 
to buy or to earn your way into heaven. If you think that, that's an insult to Christ and he wasted his time on the cross. I like those amens. I didn't have to push my button. <laughs> We're expected to do all those things, but they don't get us into heaven. It's what Jesus did that gets into heaven. We wrap our faith around it, and that's what gets us into heaven. The people that Paul was writing to had become Christians through the ministry of Epaphras. They, they heard from him how it is that the Son of God came. They heard that his name was Jesus. They had heard from him that Jesus was rejected by the Jewish authorities. They heard from him that Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. They heard from him that Jesus suffered and died on the cruel cross of Calvary to pay for their sins. The Holy Spirit had given, had given power to the words of Epaphras as he shared the good news, which is the gospel. The veil came down from their hearts which they probably had stubborn hearts. We all start out that way. Some of us stay that way. And they became born again believers and they formed the church of the Colossians that Paul is writing to. Now, he's warning them to be diligent, not to be derailed by the enemy. Paul was sure that the enemy would try. He always does. He never stops. He never sleeps. He never rests. He never stops trying to derail the work of God in us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. The evil one, father of all lies, is always looking for ways to pick off weak believers. And new Christians, hollow and deceptive philosophies, are part of his bag of tricks. And then he said about captive, that no one takes you captive. When you're a captive, some external force is restricting your freedom, restricting your movements. Paul was an expert about captivity because at this point, he was a captive. He was under house arrest in Rome. He referred to his captivity as being in chains, whether he was literally in chains, I don't know. But there was, only one, there was only one captivity, or maybe two, that is good. We all start off as slaves to sin. Sin has us. That's a captivity. Sin has us, and we don't even know it. So I said there are two captivities that could be good. One is the captivity of faith in Christ. And the other one is marriage. <laughs> you might not think of it that way, but you offer each other to be captive to each other for life. That's, I mean, that's an awesome thing. That is a sort of captivity. You don't think of it that way, but in a true, in a true sense, it is. Romans 6, 11, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. In Romans 6, 14, for sin shall no longer be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. And if we go down to Romans uh, to chapter 6 and down to verse 17 and 18, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, that's our original captivity, you have come to obey from your heart the pattern of teaching that is now that has now claimed your allegiance. So this is a transformation. This is when you come alive in Christ. This is when you emerge from darkness that you were lost in. This is when you start walking in the holy light of God. In verse 18, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. Romans 6.23 or 6.22, but now, 
that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm sure you all know that verse, one of my favorites. There is a captivity that restricts your movement. You could be a captive in jail or in a cage or in chains. But this captivity through hollow and deceptive philosophy is emotional, mental, and spiritual. The captivity that Paul was talking about is a captivity of sin. The problem is that most people don't know that they are captive to sin until they encounter Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. You can tell them until you're blue in the face, but unless the Holy Spirit convinces sinners that they need to be set free, they stay in sin. They remain captive. You can get a really big Bible and hit them over the head with it, and it won't do anything. And then he's talking about hollow and deceptive philosophy. It says through hollow and deceptive philosophy, don't let anyone take you captive. This is a tool of the enemy. He tries to get you to lean onto thoughts that appear to your own sense of things how, of how things ought to be. The core of that is worthless. Philosophies that are outside of God are destructive. Islam is one, Hinduism. I attended a Hindu temple for two years when I lived in California. That's where I went on Sunday mornings. I know a little bit about it. Buddhism. Even some so-called Christian churches and movements like Mormonism, they're ungodly. They're based on some, it's based on some mysterious leaves of gold that, that disappeared. <laughs> if you read about that. Catholicism is full of idolatry. That's, that's where we grew up. We went to Catholic school for 12 years. We were really well indoctrinated in that. It's full of idolatry. People do get saved in the Catholic Church, but they do that in spite of the church, not because of it, because their word is there. They just don't encourage people to come to Christ through faith. They, come, they encourage them to come through confessionals and just human stuff. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, verses, the Spirit clearly says that in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared with a hot iron. They forbid people to marry. Does that sound familiar? In the Catholic Church, the priests aren't allowed to get married. In order them to abstain from certain foods which God to, uh, created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and who know the truth. Did you ever hear of a church that forbade eating meat on Fridays? I guess they don't do that anymore. We were growing up, oh, you don't dare have a morsel of meat. So we had delicious fish or shrimp dinners at my house. What are you giving up? I, get, I don't understand. I never could understand that. I don't get it. I never could under, quite understand that. But I guess they don't do that anymore, except I think during a certain season they do it. Did you ever hear of a church that forbids its clergy to get married? The mindset of the, of the southern kingdom of Judea and Benjamin, which is the southern kingdom, when the Babylonians were going to attack them. Remember that Paul wrote, see to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. Jeremiah warned the people. They warned the people that, that had departed from God 
and turned to hollow and deceptive philosophies. They were listening to false prophets. Their own prophets were false and they were worshiping false gods, the Baals. They were sacrificing their children in a fire to Baal. Judgment was coming. God was using Babylon to punish Judea. God referred to Nebuchadnezzar as his servant. I'm going to bring my servant Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to read this chapter, uh, Jeremiah chapter 6, out of my Bible here. If you want to read along, if you have a Bible, put it on chapter Jeremiah chapter 6. But it says, this is Jeremiah talking to the people uh, when, the, when, the, when Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians are coming against them. Flee for safety, people of Benjamin. Flee from Jerusalem. Sound the trumpets in Tekoa. Raise the signal over Beth Hekarim. For disaster looms out of the north, even terrible destruction. I will destroy the daughter of Zion, so beautiful and delicate. Shepherds with their flocks will come against her. He's talking about the daughter of Zion, talking about Jerusalem. They will pitch their tents around her, each tending their own portion. Arise, let us attack at noon. But alas, the daylight is coming, and the shadows of everlasting of evening grow long. So arise, let us attack at night and destroy her fortress. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Cut down the trees and build siege ramps against Jerusalem. This city must be punished. It is filled with oppression. Remember, these people had abandoned the faith and were worshiping other gods in hideous ways. So he's coming against them with these people. As the well pours out its water, so she pours out her wickedness. Talking about Jerusalem. Violence and destruction resound in her. Her sickness and wounds are ever before me. Take warning, O Jerusalem, or I will turn away from you and make your land desolate so no one can live in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Let them glean the remnant of Israel as thoroughly as, thoroughly as a vine. Pass your hand over the branches again like one gathering grapes. To whom can I speak and give warning? We must leave our land because our houses are in ruins. Now, O woman, or women, hear the word of the Lord. Open your ears to the words of his mouth. Teach your daughters how to wail. Teach one another a lament. Death has climbed in through our windows, has entered from the streets and the young men from the public squares. Say, this is what the Lord declares. The dead bodies of men will lie like refuse on an open field, like cut grain behind the reaper, with no one to gather them. This is what the Lord says. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or a strong man of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will punish all who are circumcised only in the flesh, Egypt, Judah, Edom, Ammon, Moab, and all who live in the desert in distant places. For all these nations are really uncircumcised, even though the whole house of Israel is uncircumcised in heart. Who will listen to me? I was on I was on the wrong I was on the wrong I was on the wrong chapter when I turned the page. So I'm back to Jeremiah chapter six. Who will listen to me? Their ears are closed, so they cannot hear the word of the Lord is offensive to them. They find no pleasure in it. Does that sound familiar today? But I am 
full of the wrath of the Lord, and I cannot hold it in. Pour it out on the children in the streets and on the young men gathered together. Both husband and wife will be caught in it. And the old who's, who uh, those weighed down with years, their houses will be turned over to others together with their fields and their wives. When I stretch out my hand against those who live in the land, declares the Lord, from the least to the greatest, all are greedy for gain, prophet and priest alike. All practice deceit. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they say, when there is no peace. Are they ashamed of their loathsome conduct? No, they have no shame at all. They do not even know how to, how to blush. So they will, they will fall among the fallen. They will be brought down when I punish them, says the Lord. And uh, I'm going to skip down here to verse 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is and walk in it, and you will find rest for your souls. But you said we will not walk in it. Sound familiar? Today, I appointed watchmen over you and said, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But you said we will not listen. Therefore, hero nations, observe, O witnesses, what will happen to them. Here, O earth, I'm bringing disaster on this people, their fruit of their schemes, because they have not listened to my words and have rejected my law. I think I'm going to stop reading that right there. But that's going on today. Right here and in the rest of the world, that's the way people are doing. We will not listen. We're not going to listen. Scripture doesn't matter to us. It's nothing. That was Jeremiah's, Jeremiah's warning. God's warning. Do you see the similarity to today's world in our own land? Was there a chance? There's always a chance. That's why Paul wrote to the Colossians that what he did, the warning is still the same today. Maybe this world is even more wicked than it was then. What did God recommend through the prophet? Well, Jeremiah said, this is what the Lord says, stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient path. Ask where the good way is and walk in it and you will find rest for your souls. But you said, we will not walk in it. Well, the good way is the gospel. The good way is Jesus. And people say, we refuse to believe that. We're going to follow our own inclinations. Second Chronicles 7, 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. What land can't use a healing today? We live in a fallen world. This world is on a collision course with God. Just like the Israelites who refused to listen because they had allowed themselves to become captive to the philosophies of the pagan gods around them. We might in this world be more wicked than they because we refuse to believe. Churches are shrinking the churches that are growing believe in ungodly things. Gay bishops and gay pastors and rainbow stuff going on in the churches. This culture that we live in, I'm not going to say our culture because that's not our culture as Christian believers. It's the, Christ, it's the culture we live in, but it, it has become captive. Hollow and deceptive philosophies like Marxism, like this alphabet mantra that's going on, trying to take over our society. You know what I'm talking about when I say alphabet, LG, et cetera, et cetera. Trying to take over society in the schools and everywhere. We don't need humanly conceived 
notions. And that's what those are. We only need this. The word of God. This is my all sufficient rule for faith and practice. All other faiths, including socialism and Marxism and all those other isms, they are worthless. They will not get you into heaven. They might keep you out of heaven. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 5 and 6 says, Every word of God is flawless. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. Do not add to his words, or he will rebuke you and prove you to be a liar. This is the philosophy, not hollow and deceptive. This is the philosophy that true believers have to cling to. But take heart, because we have the truth. Amen? We have it. It's in a book. It's in our phone. It's in our iPad. And it's in our hearts. And we wrap our heart in faith around the truth of God. Then hollow and deceptive philosophies, which are all around us, will not take us captive. People are captives that don't even know it. So many. Searching around and believing in all kinds of... After we got saved, we cleaned house. We had a book on palmistry. We had a Ouija board. We had all kinds of weird stuff. Put it out for the trash. I used to memorize parts of the Bhagavad Gita and Upanishads. Those are Hindu scriptures. Uh, I was young and foolish then. Now I'm old and foolish in ways. <laughs> but God is so good. And we have to cling to him in our faith, in our prayer life, and fellowship with other believers. Otherwise, you can be subject to attacks. You're still subject to attacks, but hollow and deceptive philosophies, we just need to recognize those things and dismiss them. But they're in the news all the time, constantly. And they try to, they try to affect it, uh, you know, the minds of our children. They really do. So we have to stand against that. Would you stand? I read all that scripture and I still, I'm still, it's still just a little shy of noon. Imagine that. Of course, I usually let you out a little bit sooner than this. But that's okay. Father God, we come before you in Jesus' name. And we thank you for this church, Lord. And every, you know, every person that's not here, we thank you for them too, Lord. And every, every person that's on our heart, every, every unsaved loved one, every unsaved neighbor and coworker, we just ask you to send your Holy Spirit along with the word to them, Lord. We just ask you to bring victory, God's victory in every life that we encounter, and that way this church will grow. And uh, it's not just the church grows, but it's the souls, Lord. It's the souls that we're after because we want to bring them to eternity. We know where we're going, but we want them to believe so they won't perish, Lord, in the flames. So we ask you to be with each one, Lord, as we go our separate ways. Bless the things that we're doing the rest of this week and bring us back on Wednesday with an eager heart to be blessed by the word and by the morsels we consume. So go with each one, grant travel's mercies until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen.